and, and keeping to our schedule right on time. Uh, finally, again, I can't thank you enough for joining us today and being here. I'm excited about the presentation that we have. Mr. Michelangelo Caruso uh, is here to, to motivate us today. You see the bio of the program. Michael is a TED Talk speaker. He's a motivational speaker. Uh, he's going to join us today and, and speak with us about the art of communication, something we need to do with all of our clients. Uh, he's, he flew in from London Sunday night to join us, and he's flying out this afternoon to head back to do another TED Talk. So we're grateful for you giving us time and joining us tonight at the Las Vegas conference. What up, Michael Caruso. <laughs> Morning, everybody. Morning. Such a pleasure to be with you, and uh, uh, I learned so much about life market in the last 48 hours. I, I actually was learning prior to that. I interviewed some of you before I came to town. Uh, we did a Zoom call. How many were on the Zoom call? Any didn't know if I could repeat my jokes? <laughs> Apparently, those are still in play. Very good. Uh, and yeah, we're going to talk about communication. I know you're going to get a lot of product dumps on things like. Um, um, products and strategies and technical stuff that y'all do, that y'all need to do a good job in your industry. But it seems to me that, um, and I think some other people believe, that it's a good idea for us to pause here right at the outset, right with the lead-off hitter speaker, and talk about something that's super important, which is the art of communication. Uh, I was joking with the managers yesterday that, you know, a lot of us feel that we don't really need to talk about communication. It's actually redundant to talk about communication. But the psychology of communication and the psychology of persuasion are central to what you do. And persuasion not just to sell products, because I know in the financial services industry, we don't talk about selling per se. You're not even supposed to push anything. You're not supposed to push products. And yet there's a little bit of a, there's a little bit of thing that happens when you're persuading someone just to get the clarity on something, just to understand something. You're persuading them to open up their minds and maybe consider an option, right? The art of persuasion, very, very powerful. We live in a fast-paced society, and I think a lot of times we just uh, we just feel like I've been I've been talking to people for years. I don't really need to think about it anymore. I don't need to study it. And you know that if you're looking at things like nutrition or life balance or uh, anything important to you, that that good study and good review is helpful. So I not only have some good content for you today, I have some unique twists to the content. Now. We're going to handle the bullet points that are in the program for sure. But I wanted to begin today by telling you a speaker secret. Do we have any other speakers? I see Paul in the back. Hi, Paul. Do we have any other speakers in the room yet, or are they coming a little bit later maybe? Just Paul, if you're speaking today, hands up. Just Paul, okay. Oh, thank you. We met last night, so yeah? Real estate? Yep. Yeah. Look, I wish I could see your talk. I have to leave right after this. Now, here's, I'm going to tell you a little secret about the presentation business with my speaker buddies in the room. And I'm going to tell you something uh, that I've never told anybody before, ever. And I've been doing this now for um, about 25 years. In fact, I just got a million miles on Delta, one airline. I got my little, Paul, do you have a million? No? I would think you do. Uh, uh, but it's a, I didn't know it was a thing, and then the flight attendants keep coming over and congratulating me. And it, it, it is a thing. So, I'm not getting better tables at restaurants, but it's a thing. So um, here is the, uh, here's the bit I wanted to share with you. Every speaker that gets up today will give you what's called stock material. We have to, because we can't give brand new stuff every single time. Plus, we don't have to. We've got a body of knowledge that works from city to city. This is true, right? So we have some bits that they, they're, they're tried and true and they're philosophies and they're who we are as people. Think of it this way. When Fleetwood Mac goes on tour, they play Rhiannon. The song Rihanna, okay? They cannot not play it. That's Fleetwood Mac. They're expected to play it, they play it. That's their stock and trade. So when the speakers get up, and I'm just like everybody else in the room, I have these bits that I've been doing for years. I know they work, right? I know if a joke's gonna get a three or a seven on the laugh scale, because I've done it in 49 of the 50 states. But what I want to tell you this morning that I've never told any audience before is that I'm about to do this first TED Talk tomorrow, um, uh, tomorrow actually. As of tomorrow, I'll be a TED speaker. I'm not a TED speaker yet, but as of tomorrow, I'll be a TED speaker. 
is that this idea of disclosing stuff that you've never told anybody can really build a relationship. And it's interesting because we think sometimes of disclosure as a weakness, that there are certain parts of me I don't talk about in a business setting because A, it's none of your friggin' business. B, we don't have any time because I have a 57 slide PowerPoint presentation that I must show you. And three, it's irrelevant to what we're talking about. This is a business meeting, and so we will talk business. And I'm going to tell you there is no more serious mistake you can make than to leave social out of the business conversation. You must learn to disclose pieces of yourself if you want to build relationships with people. I see some heads nodding. Now, I don't know if you've got a stock bit that you disclose about yourself, but it wouldn't be a bad idea. In your presentation, you would leak, L-E-A-K, you would leak a bit about your past that would somehow not curry favor necessarily, although it could come to that, but it would put you in good stead with the other person. It would build some sort of a bond with them because you shared this intimate little piece with them. And I don't know what it is for you. I know what it is for me. And I'm, I'm remarkably flexible on this bit that I'm going to share because the same bit doesn't work with everybody. So you almost have to think in the moment, on your feet, what little intimate bit, and this is a lot to think about because you already have a lot on your mind, but what intimate bit am I going to share with this prospect? You know, or this guy that's about to leave me because the fees are going up, that I can strengthen our bond and, 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 and repair that relationship in real time, keep him aboard, and do the right thing by everybody. Not an easy thing to do. And I'm going to disclose the hell out of myself tomorrow morning talking about my life and how I got to be where I am. And I never did that before. And it's been an, it's been an interesting experience. I'll, I'll just give you a little bit here, uh, something I don't usually tell audiences, that's what I was gonna tell you. And it's in my TED talk that my, I came up to the music business, right? And we opened for acts like Rick Springfield, Corey Hart, Joan Chet, acts like that. And I really love the entertainment business. That's how I got used to being in front of people. And, uh, and while we were trying to get started, my brother Joe, at age 19, he had a full ride scholarship to Central Michigan University Music Scholarship. He came home at Thanksgiving and he didn't feel good down here. Something was wrong, he was in pain. And we went to see, he went to see the family doctor. The doctor said, no worries, it's, it's nothing. Just go back to school, enjoy your freshman year at Central. So my brother went back to school. He came home at, came home at Christmas, he could hardly walk, he was in so much pain. Now they do a biopsy and he's diagnosed with, wait for it, testicular cancer. Now you can imagine why I don't talk about this in a business meeting. It's irrelevant, doesn't build a relationship, I don't have time. And, and who knows if you care. But I want to tell you something. The statistics on cancer is that almost everybody in this room has a cancer story. Mom, dad, relative, close friend, everybody knows somebody that had cancer. And some of you in this room right now have cancer, not in the brain, but on the brain, because you're going through it right now. Hands up if cancer is in your life somehow, some way, right now. Check out the hand. Now, if I am in a meeting with you and I find a way that doesn't seem too obtrusive, too weird, too much of a left turn to talk about my brother having testicular cancer, you get one of these connections with the people in the room that just raised their hand. See how powerful that is? The trick, of course, is weaving testicular cancer into the sales presentation. Not an easy thing to do. But it starts with this premise of disclosure, sharing. It starts with that. And that's what uh, I want to encourage you to think about. You see, ladies and gentlemen, when you're presenting to people, when you're meeting people for the first time, when you're prospecting, um, uh, cold calling, uh, the first time somebody comes to your office, they're checking you out. Everybody knows this. It's an audition. Are we a fit? Those are the four words that we need to have answered. Are we a fit? Yes or no. We always book an hour meeting, but sometimes we know in five minutes, not a fit. And then we save for the whole hour. Kind of waste of time there, isn't it? And what makes it a fit is if you are authentic. And what makes you authentic is a mixed bag of things, right? Like everybody that gets on the stage, even the people that came up to get an award a minute ago, veterans in the industry, didn't feel completely natural in front of the room for them because maybe they don't do this very often. 
So because it's unnatural, by proxy they become inauthentic, maybe more reserved than they normally are, maybe, maybe a little, maybe, the, maybe even, you know, like a physical things change, pulse, stuff like that, sweat a little bit, right? If you're not authentic, you're not natural, if you're not natural, you're not believable, and then all bets are off. It's all about authenticity. How do you get there? And you get there by being real, you get there by being a person, you get there by sharing and disclosing personal, social things about yourself. So, let's talk about how to do this. This is now uh, also based in uh, psychology, uh, you know, that you're, you're, because you're sharing something personal with, your, with them, they're about to share something personal with you, which they are, they're about to disclose their assets and their fears and what they worry about when they go to bed at night because of retirement or the most anticipated recession in the history of modern man, you know? They're about to share personal stuff with you, why don't you cement the relationship early and and, and share something with them. Write this down, it's called the law of reciprocity. The person who reaches out first has influence in any interaction. I'm talking about literally reaching out with your hand, you have influence. That's why I had the reception last night. My hand first, out, every time. Not every time, but most of the times. My name's Michael, nice to see you. My name's Michael, my name's Michael. This is my habit now. And now it's a dance because I say, how are you? They say, fine, how are you? And I say, great, where are you from? You see, I'm leading the dance. And it sets up a tone and a timbre. You must be in control of your own sales calls, of your own appointments. If you're not in control, somebody else is. I've gone on ride-alongs with financial services people, also people in other industries. The meeting's booked for an hour. At 75 minutes, the prospect says to my guy, who I'm sitting next to, well, um, I got a meeting in a couple minutes, I gotta go. And the prospect ends the meeting. That's messed up. The salesperson should be ending the meeting. But the salesperson didn't do something that's central to making sure that, 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 the, that the call exactly goes the way it should. It's called the perfect sales call. We're gonna get into that in just a second. So the law of reciprocity, person who reaches out first, and it's also that, that it's the literal reach out and it's the metaphorical reach out. I'm gonna share something with you and, and I don't usually share this with people, but I'm gonna share it with you. Uh, and, and then the connection gets built and then things, you're off to the races, so it's good. Essentially what I'm talking about here is called the reverse presentation. So you may think that I'm presenting to you right now and that is technically true, but I wanna tell you something, you are presenting to me as well. And I am watching and listening. And I'm like Arnold Schwarzenegger in the Terminator. Beep, 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 beep. And I know who has a pen in their hand right now. And I know who's leaning forward leaning like Greg is, right? Versus your back against the chair. When you're forward leaning, it means you're, 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 you're pushing into the presentation, right? So you try to get your prospects to do that as you're talking. And there are words that actually get them to lean forward. Phrases. Sometimes it's the space between the words that get them to lean in. And it's just this constant little transfer, this power transfer, and, and the whole thing is under the, the, the illusion that I'm the only one presenting. Absolutely not true. I, think, I call this the reverse presentation because you're presenting to me right now, and I'm looking for buy signals from you. Not transactional signals today. Buy signals in that you're digging what I'm saying, you understand, you're, you're, you're applying yourself, right? I can tell you have a question before you have a question, sometimes. And we're gonna do a lot of Q&A here in, in a second. Okay, so the reverse presentation is about reading the room, and that's even if you're only talking to one person, you still have to read the room. You still have to address that person in a very unique situational way because it's a unique individual, and you don't know who you're talking to, you have to be very careful. Um, it should turn you on to a technique that um, I discovered when I was a sales coach for a financial services company in Michigan. You might know the name, doesn't matter but I would be going on the, these ride-alongs and sitting next to uh, my client, and uh, then there's the desk, the desk, and then there's the um, prospect, and on the other side of the prospect is the credenza. And so I want to teach you how to play credenza roulette, everybody, this is central now to, the, to this exchange. Just like us, when we come in with our preordained bits, 
The other person has preordained bits that they share. And you gotta figure out when you're talking to people who if you're seeing them at their workplace, this is what I'm primarily talking about, you're visiting them at their workplace or their home. There's stuff in the home, there's stuff in the credenza that is an indicator of who you're talking to. But here's the problem. There's a lot of stuff on the credenza, maybe 15, maybe 30 things, 30 items. But one of them is the, is the Holy Grail. One of them is the life story. Quick story. We're playing, um, I was participating sometimes in these meetings uh, just as a, uh, like, a, I'm his assistant. I'm just, I, I'm just introduced to somebody that's traveling with him, right? And uh, I would get a, a remarkable amount of attention for somebody who was uncredentialed and, you know, not, not, I'm just along for the ride. And, and I would somehow get a lot of attention from this person. And once in a while, they'd let me ask a question or two. And I would say, uh, to, I mean, this particular situation, I said, uh, uh, that photo on the credenza, that's interesting to me. So I'm playing credenza roulette, which item is the life story? I, I go after the photo, right? And it's the photo of a famous person. I can't actually remember who it was, Ben Vereen or some fam or famous actor, you know? And a child, 12-year-old child, 12, 14, something like that. And it looked like a special photograph. I, I, I just had a sense about it. I didn't know anything, but out of all the things on the credenza, I asked about this photograph. And, it, and as soon as I asked, I knew I'd hit the jackpot because this guy says, oh, like this, like he's gonna get emotional already. And I, I couldn't wait to hear what he has to say about this, right? So I said, what's the story behind the photo? And he says, well, that's Ben Vereen. And, and I said, and who's the young man? And he said, that's my son. And, and then he said, my son has MS. And we met Ben Vereen by chance at this thing. I forget the complete story, but it was this whole narrative. It's super important to him, right? That Ben Vereen took the time out to talk to his son. and Maybe his son was a dancer. I can't quite remember. But there was like this special connection between Ben Vereen and the son. And they took a picture together. And he framed this picture. And he put it on his credenza. And he looks at it 2,000 hours a year because it's so important to him. And he tells me the story. And he starts to... I am not making this up. He starts to tear up during the sales call. Now, I didn't make, need, mean to make the guy cry. I just got lucky with an inquiry about something that he doesn't mind us asking about because it's on display. You with me? <coughs> Play a few rounds. We're in Vegas, right? Play a few rounds of credenza roulette. See how you do with it. You got nothing to lose. All this stuff on the credenza is important. Try to find the most important one. Get that connection. We're practicing, as we talk about this, about something called front loading the touches. Front loading the touches. Write it down. Most salespeople work on a slow roll, and as they start to smell blood in the water, I'm being graphic here, we're getting close to the close, right? The temperature heats up in the water, everything starts to spin, and we are on our way to closing now. We've got to get that first bit of business in the door, right? So this is how it works. I want you to think about front moving some of that momentum and that inertia, not the speed of it, but this idea of front loading the touches. Now, a touch, we think of it as like a physical thing, touch somebody on the shoulder or whatever. Handshake is a touch. But a touch is also a text. Like I'm on my way, I'm on my way across town to meet you. Look for, I'm looking forward to it. That's a touch. Uh, the first point of entry, when they, when they contact your admin and say, I'm looking for a meeting, right? That's a touch. Uh, you, you, you friend them on face, uh, Facebook or LinkedIn. It's even easier on LinkedIn because it's easier to find people but, uh, and professional. You friend them on LinkedIn. That's a touch, right? Pretty cool. But you could get a half dozen touches before you actually see the whites of their eyes. And this is, this is what I'm asking you to do. Because now you're seeding, S-E-E-D-I-N-G, the relationship by getting all those seeds in the ground, waiting for them to germinate. It's pretty cool. Most people are happy to get the appointment, busy anyway, and they don't even, you know, the first touch is when they literally shake hands with the person. I think that's a wasted opportunity. I'm big on the pre-sale, you know, pre-selling the thing. Uh, for those of you that have been in the business a while, when people come to you because they, they, they're mentioning your name, you know, I, I want to do business with Hank. Hank is my guy. I keep hearing good things about Hank. I want to meet Hank, right? That, that, they're pre-sold on Hank. That's a nice place to be. And by the way, there are only two ways to become an industry expert. One of them is to write about what you do, your area of expertise, 
and the other is to speak about it. And when you talk about scaling your practice, one of the best ways to scale your practice is to start speaking to groups. Because you sell a very valuable commodity, it's called time. And you have, there's only so many hours in a week and you, you book your appointments and I assume one hour slots, maybe 90 minutes, and you only have so many of those slots, right? Some of those are gonna be a wash, you're gonna have cancellations, you're gonna have people that don't fit. But, but you, once you max out that timetable and you've got paperwork to do after they leave, there's only so much time. Imagine being in a room with 10 people at a time and 20 people at a time. I'm demonstrating that technique right now. As opposed to being on Zoom with you for an hour and 15, hour and a half, Zoom with you for an hour and a half, you see the difference. Plus I'm leveraging something called the power of the podium because if I'm in the front of the room, I must know something, I'm vetted. And you could put the same magic in place for yourself, but you have to think differently. You're not doing one-on-one -on -one appointments anymore, you're doing talks. How can you do talks? These two gentlemen have figured that out. That's why they buy airplane tickets to come here. And Paul's leaving right after his talk to go to Miami to do the same thing, probably to a larger group. And Paul's book is going like this. So think about it. You're all capable of doing this. Okay, let's talk about communication. There are two main ways to communicate with people. One is verbal and the other is nonverbal. Let me give you the 15 most powerful words you can ever use with another person. 15. I'm going to give them to you like this. The five most powerful, the four, the three, they add up to 15. Okay, ready? The five most powerful words you can ever use with another person are, I am proud of you. Sometimes you use a contraction, I'm proud of you. Now in our society, we tend to use that phrase with small people, children, I'm proud of you. But you can say it to a first time person in your office. I'm proud of you, you found a place, there's a ton of construction around here. Or I'm proud of you, you've been putting this meeting off apparently and now here we are, we're gonna talk about it, we're gonna make a plan for your retirement. This is gonna be a seminal moment for you, I'm proud of you. You say this to people, man, they just sit up straighter, they look at you in the eye, they, they sign for that compliment like a FedEx package. It's great. The four most powerful words are, what is your opinion? Now that's an interesting thing to ask since you're supposed to be the expert. But I love asking that question, what do you think? By the way, I already know the answer, sometimes. But I'll ask anyway, what do you think you should do next? How do you feel about this? And then we talk about it. Because everybody wants to be asked their opinion. And the big thing in leadership is uh, people don't want to take orders, they want to take part. Of course, of course. The three most powerful words are, will you please? It's just etiquette, it's just manners. The two most powerful words are what? Thank you. And the single most powerful word you can use with another person is what? Anybody? Don't overthink it. It's their name, it's their name. And of course in the financial services industry, unlike say customer service in other areas, you know who you're talking to. You have access to their favorite word and still don't use it. I'd set up a little micro quota for myself if I were you. And in a one hour meeting, you're gonna use the other person's name three times. Nice to meet you, Patty. Middle of the thing, Patty. I've given you a little bit of information what kind of questions you have. At the end of the meeting, Patty, what a pleasure to meet you. Get in the habit of this, man. And you're looking at it right now. I always marvel, you know, at retail stores and you give them your credit card and they still won't call you by your name. They're looking right at it. They could say, thank you, Michael. Right? Okay. Um, so these are some verbal tips. Um, I do think that there are words that close better than others. Not that it's all about closing. I'm a big fan of opening as well. But you know, if you're um, if you're sending out a subject line in an email, right? You want it, you want the email to be open. Am I correct? Why don't you use some words that would get the subject line open? Why don't, why do you freelance it all the time and, and do the first thing that comes to your head? How many of you craft the subject line, especially the important ones? Of course. And uh, so I always laugh. You know, I get an email and the subject line says uh, something like Friday. And I'm like, interesting. This Friday, next Friday, Good Friday, what? 
because I'm processing in my head, I'm looking at that big long string of emails about which one I'm gonna open first. I don't open Friday first. If you want people to open your email, you gotta make, the, make it psychologically attractive to them. It takes a few more seconds. Okay, let's talk about nonverbals. I'd like to have the five, I think five gentlemen, yeah, that, that just won the award. Would you come up and join me? And I wanna have two of the newest people uh, maybe you can help me with that, Jim or sure. Alex. Who are the two newest how about, hires? How about Levi and Camille? Levi and Camille. Give them a round of applause as they come up. Fantastic. Thank you for coming up. <laughs> we should have seven people here. Let's see if we get seven. I'm going to show you uh, uh, tips for reading the room and also tips for uh, sending, sending the right signal to the people you want to talk to. Here we are, four, five, six... I only need seven. Thank you, sir. Thank you for your service. <laughs> yeah, that's good. Thank you. All right, so we're going to show you some. Oh, thank you very much. We're going to show you some body language, uh, and this is just to illustrate. There's like tons of body language. Um, uh, Gene in the back, don't move, Gene. Everybody, well, raise your hand so everybody knows who you are, and then go back to what you were doing. Gene's doing a version of called steepling, which is this. It's a form of confidence. It's here, right? It's different. Uh, in The Godfather 3, Al Pacino, Al Pacino is not praying, his hands are off a little bit because of what's going on in the plot of the movie, right? Um, uh, this is the, sir, hand up, yes, hand up, and now back where you were. This is called the thinker pose, it's a version of Rodin's thinker, the statue, right? You send this to people when you're interested in what they're saying. This gentleman liked that because he just moved his hand to the lower part of his face. Thank you very much. <laughs> gentleman next to him doing it. We got a couple hits in the room. Forward listening thing. Now we have, oh, thank you. Don't mock me. <laughs> <laughs> uh, congratulations to all of the, um, all the top producers. Uh, and welcome. And welcome to the new people. So I want to put you in some positions. I'm going to talk about the body language positions quickly. Not only so that you can read people better, but you can send the same signal by telegraphing body language in the same way. Hands across is good, back in your pockets is fine, in front is fine, hands behind you. Arms crossed, please. Arms totally at your sides, thank you. And uh, why don't you do the thicker pose, which is up here. One hand, very good. All right, let's run them back. <laughs> so uh, this is a male-centric pose, uh, sorry, female-centric pose. Um, and, and I'll tell you why in just a second. Um, so let's have these two gentlemen come over here. Yep, you guys, the first two. Men tend to stand with their hands in their pockets. Uh, it's a guy thing, it's a very famous, uh, those of you that flew here, you'll see it on the way in the airport. You'll see the, uh, the pilots have one hand in their pocket and then the roller bag here, it's like this. It's the pilot walk. You've seen, you've seen it, people come out of their heads. They're like famous for this. And, uh, and it's a pilot. Flight attendants don't do it, by the way. Just, just men. And so, uh, and sometimes it's accompanied by, you know, this noise. And this is not good for anybody, right? <laughs> so, flight, so. Flight attendant doesn't have a pocket. That's exactly they right. That's exactly right. A flight attendant doesn't have pockets. Women don't do this. They do other things. They have issues, right? Women, men have issues. Women have issues. Women cross their arms. And, and it's a sign of, um, uh, sometimes it's a sign of uh, insecurity. Sometimes it's a sign of they're not comfortable. Women in their defense will say, well, it's neither of those things, I'm just cold. Well, ladies, there's a new invention out, it's called a sweater. And if you wear a sweater, you can uncross your arms and you won't be sending people unnecessary negative signals about your own body language, right? So you can relax, sir, thank you guys can sit. Thank you very much. <laughs> You're getting applause, but you really didn't do that much. It's <laughs> all right. This is a biblical reference. Uh, it's, a, it's, a, it's called the fig leaf. <laughs> it's a passive, all of these positions have uh, connotations. Uh, passive, aggressive, or um, assertive. What, what, what connotation is this pose? It's passive. You see it a lot in photographs. You, people do this in church. People do this when they come up to get an award. Uh, it, you know, it's a little bit, uh, it's a little bit inauthentic because it's not a natural pose. It's not something people just naturally do. You know, 
But in front, in certain situations, it's just like you just naturally gravitate toward that. Thank you very much. No bunter. Hands behind the back, a uh, military uh, reference. It's uh, called parade rest, also a passive position. It's not secretive so much as just um, at the ready, you know, this kind of a thing, uh, but it's passive. And the hands across is almost defiant, right? Um, and we just put your hands on your hips like this with me. This is called Superman. <laughs> and this is aggressive, right? You see, uh, if you pass a construction site, there'll always be 10 people working. Uh, sorry, 10 people on site, only two are working. And the other eight people are standing like this. <laughs> you know, it's just, a, it's just a thing. Thank you very much, sir. Um, oh, we already covered this. Sorry. Yeah, not a good amount. Um, but I think that, especially in these sensitive times, that women and men can be more careful about their communication in more ways than one. So this is, this is kind of what we're getting at right now. Thank you very much. Um, I'm going to save you for last. This is the figure pose. Now we know we can happen in your seat, and it can happen uh, standing up. And it sends a signal like, um, you can sit, sir, thank you. It's a, it sends a signal like you're uh, talking to somebody, and you say, uh, or somebody's talking to you, and they say something interesting, and you say, um, uh, just kind of like slowly like, oh, that's, that's really interesting. I never really thought of it that way. See? So let's all do it together, please. Hang with me. Uh, hands at your side. And when I say, when I count to three, move one hand to slowly to the lower part of your face. It, it, it seems like the corniest thing ever. It would never work. It works like a charm. One, two, three. Hmm, that's interesting. You see? And you watch, man. People go, people, you guys start getting a feedback like, he's the best listener. You know, it, it's just a little trick, right? It's beautiful. Okay, so we left um, uh, Levi with his arms and his sides, and the reason this is important is because it's the natural position. I mean, your hands belong at the bottom of your arms, and yet sometimes it, it feels like the least natural. You've been standing this way for a little while now, how do you feel it? Great. Yeah, it is a natural position. There's no subterfuge here. There's nothing going on. It's just how we're meant to stand. And it wouldn't kill you to take your hands out of your pockets, gentlemen, once in a while, is what I'm saying. A round of applause for Levi. So verbal and nonverbal communication, they play a big important part in the mix and we want to keep an eye on them. Let's stay with verbal for a second and talk about something called the art of the question. How many of you know what a binary question is? Hands up. Kind of easy to guess. Binary is two, right? These are questions that can be answered either yes or no, Tuesday or Wednesday, morning or afternoon, right? But, they, but they're fairly transparent. You know, this is how you narrow somebody down pretty quickly. You know, is Tuesday or Wednesday better for you? <laughs> you know, morning or afternoon? Apparently, apparently Star Wars is in the building. <laughs> There's a big production next door. I, I stepped in there to see if it was discount tire and it's, uh, the guy thought it might be McDonald's or something. Big sound system. So I apologize for that. So the art of the question, uh, you want to use uh, binary questions, uh, but you also, more importantly, want to use non-binary questions. These are the questions that people must answer. They must express themselves. It cannot be answered with a one-word thing. And they start with how or what, right? It makes them talk to you. And you've got to get people to talk to you to develop that know, like, and trust thing. They're never going to share their deepest, darkest money secrets with you if they don't trust you. You've got to get them to open up. So you need these like can opener questions, can opener language to get them to open up. Okay. Now in sales, there's uh, I, I don't I don't know anybody else that talks about this. I named it the binary uh, question sandwich because in a one hour meeting, the first 10, 15 minutes are nothing but binary questions because you're trying to figure out if you're a fit. So you're asking questions like, uh, tell me a little bit about you know, your assets or your book. You have your own script for this, I'm sure. But you've got to qualify them and figure out if they're a fit because you just want to work with anybody. Please tell me you don't want to work with anybody. Okay, you might help anybody, but maybe you don't want to work with anybody. You know what I'm saying? And so you're asking these, these early questions. In my case, as a keynote speaker, people call me, they go, uh, I want to know how much you charge. And I say, well, I'm happy to get to that. I say, uh, but do you have a date for the event yet? They say, no, we don't have a date. I say, call me when you have a date. I don't want to waste an hour talking to somebody that doesn't even have a date. Second one is, I say, uh, what's your normal budget for speakers? They say, I don't know. I say, well, why don't you call me, find out and call me back. 
I'm here all day, you know, because they want to move right into my time clock and they're not ready, right? And so I, I don't let them. I, I'm nice about it. I'm getting into the shorter version. I'm nice about it. I still might stay on the line with them for another 10 minutes, but they don't get an hour if there's no budget, no date. Not, not necessarily, not automatically. So I'm um, using these questions, the binary questions at the beginning, are we a fit? In the middle of the one hour, I always use one hour just it's easy to do the math. In the middle of the one hour session, I move to non-binary binary questions. And now we're talking about things that they have to explain to me, right? And they're asking me questions, by the way. They, they fall right into this formula. They're asking me things I can't answer by, with one word answers. I say, well, it depends, let me explain. This strategy does this, this strategy does this. And then here's the beautiful part. At the end of the one hour presentation, we go back to binary questions. With what kind of questions? Anybody? Are you ready? Would you like to start? How much money would you like to, uh, you know, you ought to have your favorite thing. Please tell me you have a 10 word close. <coughs> I'm going to take that as a no. A 10 word close is the 10 word question that is the lever that, that says we're, we're going to do business together. And the 10 word close has these hidden ingredients like uh, I worked with a lot of guys and gals in the um, financial services where they really wanted a piece of business that was like 100,000 and they'd settle for 50,000 but they end up articulating the person says, well, how much do people usually give you? And they go, oh, 20 is fine. And what do you think they got most of the time? 20. Why? Because that's the number they put on the table. 20 is good enough, you know? So think about the perfect sales call. What's the, what's the amount of money that you want to get from people on the first dip? No, it isn't 20. What is it for you? Is, it, is 20 good? It's what? All of it. All of it. Oh, all of it, yeah, thank you. I want 110% of your money. But let's say the number's 50. Then ask for 50, tell them, you know, and you can say it in, in a number of ways. You can say, well, my most successful clients start with 50. I love that because I'm not fibbing. I didn't say everybody does it. I didn't even say I've done it in the last year. But my most successful clients start with 50. They're in the game now. Find something that you can live with and sleep with at night. It's not hard, but try to get to that 10 words because once you commit to it, like those are the 10 words that close more business for you than any other sentence in the English language. Don't you want it? In my case, I sent you to uh, YouTube. Is this, uh, how can I turn this on? Can you do it we'll do the YouTube channel. Uh, because I can use video to sell, you know, I've, everybody has like, techniques for this, right? To get, in, to get inside people's heads and help them establish clarity. That, and what I want to establish is that I am the perfect speaker for your keynote event. I am the guy. There's others out there, but I'm the right guy. And nothing conveys that more than a video. I'm not going to show you the video because you can find it on your own. But nothing does this like video in my business. So I send you, this, I send you the video and you go, Oh my God, this is what we want. I can't do that on the phone. There's a live audience in the video. They're cackling like hands because I'm so funny, apparently. And, uh, and the video, that video has closed more business for me. That's my 10 word close. I'm gonna have another verbal one too. Maybe for you guys, it's a strategy that closes, but I don't think so. I read a book recently called um, you are about to make a big mistake. That's the name of the book. It's by a, a, a lady named, I think it's a lady, Siboney, S-I-B-O-N-Y. You are about to make a big mistake. I did the audio book. Get audible, read, read a book a month, do yourself a favor and read within your industry, right? So here I am just reading a book about psychology and, and it, it's primarily about what, um, it's primarily about, um, uh, the psychology of, of uh, how people think and uh, the cognitive biases. There's about 150 of them. She's going to run them down in the book, right? And uh, uh, thank you. That's good. Uh, and uh, and uh, 
in the book, there's a section, there's a, I don't know, she just interviews a bunch of financial services people. And I'm like, that's cool, I'm about to speak the life mark. This is handy. I didn't know what was gonna happen. And in the book, she says that uh, one of the big problems now in financial services, you guys tell me if you disagree, is that you know we're well out of the information age. You know we already left the information age, right? We're in the experiential age now. We, we entered the information age because of web 1.0, everybody has access to the same information now, almost everybody, right? So here's my point, is the strategies that you have, that, that you give them, is like your, that's, like your, that's like your proving point right there, the strategy, everybody has them. I mean, you might have access to some unique author or something, but everybody has strategies, ladies and gentlemen. It's not about the strategy. You have to share the strategy, you have to talk about it, but that's not what closes the deal. What closes the deal is your relationship and the no like and trust and the bond that you created in 60 minutes or four 60 minute sessions. Does this make sense to you? All right, keep your questions. I'm gonna get, get to them. So Simone says it's not, it's not about you know, the information that you're pushing at them, it's about the relationship. That's what I want to mention that to you. So uh, the, if you subscribe to this YouTube channel and make sure you click that silver bell, uh, then when the new videos come out, you just get a quick notification. These are two minute um, booster shots for you, right? If you're into that sort of thing. Uh, that will help you with this kind of thing that we're talking about right now, right? I will visit you again and share another little tidbit with you that's sharpened your game. And I do a video about the 10 word presentations and I'll do a video about body language and you just keep getting it until you get it right and it's part of you. Okay. I want you to ask questions in a five to one ratio. Five to one. And the reason for that is, again, you're leading the dance. They're, and, and, and it's not that you're asking a lot of questions, it's that they're not asking any questions of you. I went to go uh, change doctors the other day, a while back. And, uh, and I started asking the doctor questions about like where he went to school and what his specialty is and if his career turned out the way he thought it would and the best part of his job and the worst part of his job. And he keeps looking at his watch because he's billing me in six minute increments, right? And then he says, well, what did you come in for? I said, he said, what do you, what's the matter? I said, there's nothing wrong with me, I'm healthy. He said, well, where does it hurt? I said, I don't have anything wrong. I wanted to talk to you to see if I wanted you to be my doctor. And he looked at me like I was speaking French, like nobody ever does this. He said, well, you know, we're gonna charge you for this appointment. And I said, I hope so. I took your time. Most doctors get a free consult, but if that's why you want to roll, let's do it, you know. But I wanted to have that bond with my doctor, you know. So um, five to one question, five to one ratio in questions. All right, I want to get down to uh, selling and some special techniques that you can use to get your game going. I was, uh, I'll tell you a little story, I was golfing. Golfers in the room? Yeah. I was golfing one time and uh, spraying the course pretty good. And you know how golf is, very polite. The yeah, golf etiquette is, you're not supposed to offer a golf tip. <coughs> so the other three guys in your foursome were just, they're, they're just waiting for you to get it together, you know? And then eventually, if you go, oh man, somebody give me a tip, then they step forward and they help you, right? That's golf etiquette. So around the fourth hole or something, I, I'm actually beside myself. I've never golfed this bad. I don't know what something's inside my head. What's going on? And uh, I said, anyone, Bueller, you know, give me give me something here. And my buddy Jeff comes up to me and he says, I think I have something for you. And I go, anything, man, because this is going to be a long day if I don't get this sorted out. And he goes. Why don't you try to swing slower? And I did. And it, and it, might, and it just cleaned it, cleaned it right up. It was almost like you wave the magic wand over it, you know? But now if you think about it, you don't have to golf to understand this. If you think about this, it wasn't that I was swinging slower that made the ball go straight. It's that I was not trying to hit it so hard. It was that I was, I was, I was focused on something else instead of whatever I was doing, and it just cleaned up my stroke right away. It was a beautiful thing. I started thinking more about this, and, and I started publishing and just testing the theory out in, my, in sales when I'm doing coaching, and uh, started encouraging salespeople to sell more slowly. 
sell more slowly, and front load those touches, and just do that little like press and become a, because when you work too fast, you know, people get suspicious. That's when you become salesy. Um, if you don't want to be treated like a salesperson, stop acting like a salesperson. Stop using sales speak. Stop moving people through the sales process where they're, where they're feeling like he's, he's moving me now, you know? Or she's moving me now. You know what I'm talking about. So, <laughs> try to sell more slowly. Um, we talked about speaking to groups. Uh, I want to, uh, we'll get the Q&A here in just a second. Uh, I want to uh, also share with you this idea of protecting the close. Now, we've been using the one hour sales model in this talk today. Protecting the close ha uh, is important because um, you're not the only one talking to your, in, during your sales presentation. You, you're, hopefully, you will. Once you're done with your, 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 your dog and pony show, you now have to give them, as the Native Americans say, the talking stick, and they get to talk. And that exchange is gonna happen several times. And so if things get bogged down, and they have a question, and then you answer them, and I still don't understand, or let me explain it again, you know? And then say, do you know so-and-so? And, -so? and that, wasn't, that wasn't part of the original conversation. You know, yeah, I know him, but I know him through this. Pretty soon, you know, you're coming up on 50, 55 minutes, and you haven't even tried to close. And you have more appointments, you know, coming. So you're off your game. And when you protect the close, this doesn't happen. So in a one hour sales meeting, what we're calling now the perfect sales call, you would be into the close by say minute 44-ish, or maybe even minute 40. Why so soon in an hour call? Does anybody know? Because you've got 20 minutes left. Why so soon? That's right, that's exactly right, from the veteran. Because, because, there's, because nobody ever says, yep, let's go, green light, you know? What's that? If they do, there's something wrong. Yeah, if they do, if they do though, it's weird. So what you wanna do is, uh, at by minute 40, you, and, and by the way, you've been marking the trail the whole way with things called trial closes and anchors. An anchor is, a, an anchor is something like, a, are you with me? Are you with me? Does this, if they're a thinker, does this, does this make sense to you? If they're an emotional person, how does this feel to you, right? So you're, and they're saying yes, 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 right? And so this whole time, and the trial close is, you know, the average person, uh, uh, I'd say half the time, uh, you're probably wondering what happens next. About half the time, people make a commitment to uh, uh, surrender a chunk of money, I don't know what language you guys use. Surrender is probably not the right word. Uh, what do you say? What is it? Commit. 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 Fine. What did you say? It's okay. Yeah. No, I can't hear. Oh, chunk of money. Okay, yeah. Fine. Whatever it is, everybody's different, right? You say the average joke. The chunk of money is five. Okay, it's, it's hard to hear, I'm sorry, sir. So, um, uh, and do we have two microphones, Amber, or just one? Just one, okay. Um, so, uh, what you want the, what, what the ideal thing to happen is at minute 40 now, he's gonna, he's gonna have objections, or a hesitation, or I gotta talk to my cousin, who's also a financial planner, you know, he's, you know, he's always got a cousin that does this. And that's when most people fold their tent and give up. Okay, got to talk to the cousin. Game over. And then you burn the other 20 minutes, uncomfortably burn it because you now you know you've lost it. All you've sold is another meeting. Maybe not even that, you know. And I've been there, and I don't do that anymore because that's when the conversation actually gets started. Tell me about your cousin. Where does he work? How long has he been doing this? Uh, does he have certifications? Is he seen seven? Or would you just work with him because he's in, I'm just curious. Would you just work with him when he's, because he's in the family or is he remarkably successful at what he does? And they start telling you about reasons why the cousin's a decoy man. He's not going to do business with the cousin. They're stalling you. They don't want to make a commitment because they've got an excuse in the cousin. They're going to use it. And they put the cousin between you and the deal and 
and you fell for it. It wasn't even real. But by talking to them about it and learning more about the cousin, there's genuine interest. You're not trying to find them out or make them look bad. You're just saying, oh, okay. Okay. Now I know. Thank you. I can't tell you how many calls I've been on with people. It might have even happened with Jim in a way because we were talking about terms or something. And uh, I said what it was, and I think Jim said something like, well, that's not something we can, we're, we're not comfortable with that, or I don't know the words were, but it's not, it's not a good fit for us. Do you remember? And I'm like, okay, let's talk. I didn't say, okay, sorry, it didn't work out. I said, okay, let's talk. <laughs> Write that down, man, that's a great one. Okay, let's talk about it. And then you keep talking. They're still sitting in your chair, they're still in your office, man. All these not lost. And you never, ever want to make people do something they normally wouldn't do, ever. We run an ethical shop at LifeMark, not deceiving anybody. So I need you to raise your right hand and repeat after me. I, I your name, I promise never to use my powers for evil. I promise never to use my powers for evil, that's it. Okay, let's do some Q&A. What? kind of questions do you have? This is an important time because um, because when you go back to work again, you're going to be off, you're not going to be in this mind, this head space anymore. <coughs> yes, uh, I'm going to come to you because it is hard to hear. Why don't you use the mic? Tell us uh, your name, where you work. John Kelly, Phoenix. I paid very close attention, but I did not get your 10 word close. <coughs> Can you, can you share with us? Yeah. Uh, put me on the spot. <laughs> so I'm flexible with the 10 word close. I like it in concept a lot more than I like it in practice because it's like saying I got a hammer now and use the hammer on everybody when I really need a screwdriver or a needle nose pliers. But I am going to use a tool called the 10 word close. I think I told you that the video is really what closes people for me. Uh, but I'll say something like uh, I sometimes say, uh, Okay, here's an example. So I've got a, uh, the sheet I use is actually getting to know you. That's, that's actually like the name of it. It's on the tab of the file that's in the ca filing cabinet, you know, getting to know you. And, I, and I, in the call, I walk them through a series of questions and things I need to know about the event. Budget, where is it at? Uh, how long is it? Uh, I'm looking at travel time on the ground when I get there. I'm looking at all the criteria. What makes this desirable to me? If they pass all that criteria, I'll say something like, an anchor. It sounds like we might be a good fit. What do you think? If they say no, end of conversation. Maybe, maybe, it, or I need to fix it. If they say yes, we'll proceed down the trail a little bit more. Uh, okay, so we're a good fit. And then I say something like, uh, did you know that I have a background? I could have said this to Jim. You don't have an extensive background in financial services, which is an invitation for him to say, like what? Oh my God, please tell me this isn't going to continue. It is a nice song, though. Uh, and he says, like, what? Yeah, he says, like, what? And I go, well, I was, uh, I, I was uh, employed by uh, Iowa State Bank for uh, almost a year, helping them, uh, the loan originators, get more business into the bank, make smarter decisions about reading, reading uh, people who wanted to borrow money. Uh, and I was a sales manager for, uh, for an active money manager in Michigan for four years, sales coach. Uh, and I did this, this, and this, and I've, uh, uh, many financial planners have called me for coaching, individual coaching, and by the time I'm done, I check that box, right? And so, and so I'll say, at some point I'll say something like, I use humor a lot, and I use a close called the porcupine close. Anybody know it? Porcupine, right angle close. There's about 22 closes, so 10 word closes. You could use 10 words for any of these closes. But the porcupine close is like this sudden thing where it just comes at you and sticks you, and you go, okay, I'll do it. I don't know, okay. It's amazing. Remember, I don't know, let me get there in a second, John. John, uh, remember that uh, people do not purchase anything, most things, with the, uh, with the left side of their brain, the rational side of their brain. You know about brain dominance theory, right? Left brain, right brain? The left brain's rational, linear, logical, right? Right brain is emotional, poetry, songs, personal stories, right? 
even big purchases like automobiles require with the right side of their brain when they're deciding who the financial planner is. There, there is some left brain activity going on, but they, if they don't like you, man, they're never coming your way. And so I might say, John, something like, uh, here, here's the humor part. It sounds like I'm the perfect opening keynote for your convention. And I'll laugh, and then they'll laugh, and they say, well, I gotta talk to one more person, or they'll say, yeah, it sounds like you are, you know, how can we, how can we secure your services? It sounds like I might be the perfect keynote speaker for your convention. Sorry, 12 words. Boom. Questions? I still owe you these bullets, too, I'm gonna do that. Yeah, let's do it. I appreciate the, uh, the feedback and the conversation. Uh, Rick, Rick, Rick Sowers, Tampa Bay, Florida. Um, you mentioned when you were talking about anchors or the test closure about uh, if someone was a real person versus, I suppose, a, a, a visual. Yes. I didn't say that, but yes. can you touch on that a little bit more? Uh, so I'm a fan of Tony Alessandro. Uh, he's an older guy now. Uh, because he's got a really simple personality assessment that I use in the field, right? The problem with uh, Myers-Briggs and all these, they're very sophisticated in the, if I, how many of you have done Myers-Briggs? Okay, and then when I ask you what style you are, you go, I can't actually remember, it's too complicated. Right, that's the problem with Myers-Briggs. So this one is very simple. Um, and I created it for the managers, uh, and I'll create it for you very quickly right now. So I want you to draw a matrix in your notes. That's a vertical line and a horizontal line. So four quadrants. I'll give you the four styles. I'll answer your question. You have to write this down otherwise because you won't remember. So in the upper left corner is the relator. You, use, you want to use this on your spouse when you get home. Just to figure, just to figure out what, what's going wrong sometimes. Relator in the upper left hand corner. Socializer in the upper right hand corner. Relator, socializer. Lower left hand corner is the thinker and the lower right-hand corner is the director. One more time. Upper left, relator. Upper right, socializer. Lower left, thinker. Lower right, director. Four styles. Each of the styles has a plus and a minus, a forehand and a backhand. The forehand's the accurate, powerful shot. The backhand's the one they spray all over the place. Weakness and a strength. Here we go, relator, strength, connectors. They're people people, relators. It's in the name, relate. Right? What's the downside to relators, quickly? Bad with conflict. They dodge it. If there's conflict, they, they don't want to be in the room. They let somebody else take care of it. Not, not good with conflict, relators. Moving over now to the upper right corner, socializers. Great people to have around, they're fun, man. They love life. They make everything fun. They make a hospital visit fun. They joke about their health, right? What's the downside to socializers? They are sometimes hard to take seriously because they're always joking. To the minus. Thinker in the lower left. Absolutely the best decision makers. These are the ones that eat up your clock because they want to see all the strategies and they want to deeply understand them. They're going to go home and research them independently. It takes forever to close these people, but they make really good decisions. So the plus is make good decisions. Downside is they have an insatiable need for more info. Even when it doesn't serve them, they want more info. They can't decide, can't decide, can't decide. Lower right corner are the directors. The director craves two things, efficiency and productivity. If these people come to your office, they better see those two things or you're gonna be ruled out right away. Efficiency and productivity. And the downside to directors is that they sometimes achieve efficiency and productivity at the expense of their greatest resource, people. So they sometimes perceive as rude or um, not caring. Now your question was about, go ahead, you have something? Tony Alessandro from San Diego, yeah. Uh, he's not terribly well documented online, but he calls it the platinum rule. And I'll give, you, I'll give you the punchline right now. We all grew up with something called the golden rule, which we learned in school, they also teach it in church. Do you remember the golden rule? Do unto others as you would have them do unto you. Do you remember this? Alexander says that's a bunch of crap, especially in sales. I mean, think about this. This gentleman's a thinker, and I'm a socializer, 
Do unto others as you would have them do unto you. I'm a socializer. I'm going to treat the thinker like a socializer. How's he going to like that? Not at all. He's going to think, I'm an idiot. <laughs> Alessandra says you want to use something called the platinum rule. Do unto others as they want to be done unto. Whoa. What's that do? Okay. He's a thinker. How should I treat him? Like a thinker. What's a thinker want in these meetings? Facts, data, information, right? You give those to the socializer, they, they're like, la, 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 you know, they, it's, you're wasting your time. They don't care. You might have to do it to satisfy compliance, but that's not what's attractive to them. The socializer likes to know that you like to have a good time in these meetings. Socializers don't want to meet in your office, they want to meet in a bar or a restaurant. And there's nothing wrong with that, right, if you can work it out. So your original question had to do with these styles? It's the field, the field person versus the, the yeah. All right, so check this out. Draw an extra heavy score on the horizontal line. Make the horizontal line heavier. Because all of the stupid, all of the, the two styles that are above the horizontal line are people people. These are feeling people. They love, they have to have other people involved, and it's very important to them. The relator wants to make somebody happy. They like to make people happy. There's another person in that equation. The socializer doesn't like to have fun by themselves. They like to be with people, right? The thinking thing is a very solitary thing. They don't need others for that. And the director actually doesn't like people most of the time. They don't, you know, they, they just, people are just something for them to manage. So that's the feeling, thinking part, really sliced and diced. Now, we had a question yesterday. Somebody said, I saw you. Uh, somebody said, well, how do you know what the other person is? And the answer, of course, is they'll tell you if you ask them non-binary questions. They tell you by how they're dressed. Look at the colors they're wearing. Look how they wear their hair. Is their hair product in their hair? You know, is uh, try to see, uh, have a look outside in the parking lot when they pull in. What are they driving? Is the car clean? Do they carry a pen with them to the financial services meeting, or do you have to give them a notebook too? Well, that's the socializer, right? Now, none of this stuff is automatic and 100%, but it's just little guidelines. And, you have, and if you're paying attention, it's valuable intel. The best. We had a question over here. I'll do the bullets for you, and I got a goodbye story for you before we're done. Mark, is it? Sure. Um, hi. I'm curious about how a lot of people perform as if they were in the top half, but actually make their decisions as if they're in the bottom half. Is that something that Tony's um, decision tree, concept, theory, and field work on? Top half of what? Of this, of this matrix. Oh. I see a lot of people that act as if they're socializers, for example, mm -hmm. but they make decisions as if they're thinkers. Well, uh, think of it this way. Uh, you remember genetics from school, you have uh, dominant genes and recessive genes, right? So you'd be a dominant a socializer, but you have strong recessive thinker traits. You know, I'm not a genealogist, but you can understand how somebody can have uh, multiple pieces of this. But they're primarily one thing. By the way, you're primarily one thing too. But, but in general, you, you, you'll get some guidance from this. And if you start to see it, maybe you diagnosed them wrong, right? Maybe you got it wrong. Maybe they really are thinking. They just were playing the socializer in the early stages, right? Now, now the knives come out, and they want to see the, you want to see more documentation. What else? Are we good? Yes, sir. Let's do it. I'm Alex Knight um, from Centennial, Colorado, and my question is: How do you move an emotional person to the towards the close. Uh, an example, a woman lost her husband, the husband left her hundreds of thousands of dollars, but she does not want to make a mistake and will practically paralyze and not moving along. We, uh, you can leverage something that is uh, one of the oldest tools that we have, but we've gotten away from it as a society because we live in uh, politically charged, sensitive times. Ladies and gentlemen, the art of the compliment is leaving our society. It's become too invasive to say nice things about other people. It's, it's misinterpreted, 
often. Um, it, it doesn't land. It becomes more trouble than it's worth. And we zip it and we just, we, we're stuck now with have a nice day and good evening, and, you know, simple, neutral stuff. So here's what I would suggest. Uh, there are two types of compliments. We covered this with the managers yesterday. Two types of compliments, inside compliments and outside compliments. Inside compliments are the most valuable, but outside is the only one we ever give. Outside compliments are based on visual triggers. Uh, you see it, and then you say it. I like your hair. I like your shoes. Looks like you got some sun this weekend, right? And our society loves that. We say thank you, you know. Check the box, what do you mean? Beautiful. But it's inside compliments that mean the most. I'll get to your, your hypothetical there in a second. But inside compliments are about things you can't see. Like what? Anybody? Yeah. See? Yeah, uh, feelings could be energy, could be uh, uh, you seem like an honest person, it could be integrity, it could be principles, it could be uh, 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 I, I admire people that do what you do for a living, right? So you, you, you could do this if you wanted to, you set your mind to it. And that's the compliment that could land with this woman. She's unsure, she doesn't want to do the wrong thing. So tell her, she's a very intelligent woman, in your brief time with her, I'm very impressed with how you've got this put together. And I just know whatever decision you make will turn out great. You seem like a smart lady, and you just let it, let it sit there for a minute. You, you see? Now, nothing works every time, but I, I think that's where I would go in that situation. She doesn't want to do the wrong thing. You assure her she will not do the wrong thing. And what do you know? You, you were just talking. It's not a guarantee, you know, you know. You can't be sure either, but it's just human nature, man. It was, you know. Relax, everything's gonna be fine. Most of the time, that's all people wanna know. People that are ringing your phone off the hook right now about all this war and the recession and the supply chain, all they wanna know is everything's gonna be fine. I know the devil's in the details. Let's do the bullets quick. I'm still open, the request line is still open for questions. Uh, we said we're gonna read people better. I think we covered that. We covered the verbal cues, the seven body language positions. Active listening is also called forward listening. We said Greg was doing it earlier. You know, when you're standing up, you do it like this. Watch, little, little step forward like this. That's all, half, half step, like this. Or the lean in, you know, right? So be conscious of these little signals because they improve your communication. Um, the three ways to know people are, uh, one is the personality assessment that I just gave you, showed you. The second way is the brain dominance theory. Are they a left brain person or a right brain person? And sometimes I just have fun. I just ask them, I said, you ever hear about this left brain, right brain thing? Because you're having trouble getting a handle on the person in the meeting. And they go, yeah, I've heard of it. Well, which one are you? <laughs> are you left brain or right brain? Just tell me, save us all a lot of trouble. And they go, oh, I'm definitely a left brain person. I go, thank you very much. Let's continue, you know. So sometimes just asking them what they are is pretty cool. The third way is from a book called Dr. Kevin Lehman, um, or Lehman maybe, L-E-H-M-A-N, and it's called The Birth Order Book. There's a lot of compelling research that where you are in the birth order, Levi's nodding his head, where you are in the birth order determines your personality later in life. For example, if you're first born sibling in your family, if you are the first born sibling, raise your hand. A lot of you, okay. So the, according to the research, the firstborn is an early adopter. He's the de facto parent. He's the standard bearer. Uh, all these things, see a lot of people nodding their heads. I'm the firstborn and I'm saddled with it, man. I can't call my brothers and ask them how they're doing without them reading into it. Are you checking up on me? No, I'm just your oldest brother asking how you're doing. <laughs> but it's an old script, right? We can't let go of it. Um, the youngest child um, often likes attention. Um, the reason is they get used to getting attention. Not only, like, see, when I was born, I got attention from two people, my mom and dad. When my brother Rob was born, he got attention from my mom and dad and three older brothers who pestered the hell out of him. So he started to get used to the attention, and then he started to learn he could perform for the attention and actually make it more of it. And now, when you talk to Rob, it's showtime. He's just always trying to make you laugh and entertain you. I love him, you know, but that's Rob. 
The middle children sometimes suffer, not suffer, struggle with their own identity because they're not the oldest, they're not the youngest, especially in big families. You know, who am I? And finding their own identity and coming, coming to play. It's a complicated thing. I just gave you the simple version of it, but it's another way to know people. And you, are, you already said, we already said, you're gonna be asking people personal questions now. Tell me about your family. How long you, how long you been uh, living here in this town? Uh, tell me about your family. What did your dad do when he grew up? Great question. That tells you so much about the person. What did your dad do? What did your mom do for work? Love that. Um, and then how many siblings did you have? Where were you in the birth order? You can't open with that question. Hey, nice to meet you. Where were you in the birth order? <laughs> you know, you gotta warm up to it. Okay, very good. Uh, the two things that motivate people every time, anybody, any psychology majors in the room? Aristotle said it first, then Freud. Uh, close, pain and pleasure. Pain and pleasure. So uh, in bull markets, you're selling the pleasure. Everybody wants a piece of that pie, right? And in bear markets, they're in pain and they want to move money and they want to panic and they want to day trade and they want to change advisors, you know? You know the game. So use those two levers to get them to do the right thing. Not what you want them to do, but the right thing, the thing that's best for all concerned. Techniques for leveraging both as financial advisors. I don't know what that was about. Maybe we covered it. A deep dive in the lost art of the compliment, which we did. Communicate with authenticity, we opened with that. Uh, how to use the doctor frame. Um, so that's a little takeoff on when um, I, I said that the doctor said to me, where does it hurt? That's what you say to your clients, right? So they come in and they say, uh, you say to them, where does it hurt? And you're joking, but what do you mean, where does it hurt? Well, why, why did you want to see me today? What's going on? Get right to it. You know, that's like jumping in the pool. You know, you, you've got some money and something's not working because you came to see me today and I'm not your guy. I'm not your financial advisor. Why? And once they tell you that, if they tell you the truth, well, you got your, you got your minutes all laid out for you. If they dodge that question, and they often do, sometimes they don't know the answer. Now you got a bunch of detective work you have to do. Um, and then, of course, we talked about the ideal uh, perfect sales call. If it's an hour, uh, when, when you start to close, it may be 40, this kind of thing. Other questions, thoughts? And uh, Greg and Alex or anybody I've been working with, if you, if you think that there's fodder here for more uh, conversation on any of these topics, let's do it. We've got a few minutes. I have a newsletter, it's here. The website, if, you, if somebody is working in real time, is just my name, michaelangelocaruso.com forward slash Friday hyphen five. So every Friday, I promise you it will be the best newsletter you ever get, because no long articles, just little bits, right? Communication, persuasion, uh, sometimes it's a book review or a, a book recommendation. Um, and of course you can quit the list anytime. But uh, I don't do a newsletter per se, it's more of a fun tip sheet. And uh, people don't quit my list because I try really hard to give them really good stuff. Uh, as long as we're on the subject, I also run a free Facebook group for those of you that do presentations, interested in scaling your business and getting to 10, 20, 50 people at a time through group presentations. I promise you, this is a, this is a shortcut to success. You know, they say there aren't shortcuts, but you gotta get more people into your funnel. Right? And so do these talks, and they're sometimes sponsored by the Chamber of Commerce. The Chamber of Commerce in your town is obligated to provide educational content for their members, and they're dying for good speakers. And if you belong to the Chamber, they're gonna have a look at you first. I've even partnered with people from my audience the next time I'm through town, and I'll do the event with you, because I, I believe in this, you know? I wanna be in front of groups. I'd love to work with you again in another context. So this is in my wheelhouse, I believe in it, I walk the walk, and if you don't want to work with me, that's fine, I'll still tell you how to do it, because I think it's good for you. Other thoughts? Too much? Did I, did I fire hose you? I just tell people fire hosing is not a form of hydration. 
All right. I, I, I love you guys. I appreciate what you're doing. I think that we're going to need you here moving forward based on some of the things we're hearing about the supply chain and inflation. And uh, we're going to need some smart people telling people what the real story is instead of uh, misinformation and subterfuge. So thank you for all the good work that you do. Uh, Jim has been fantastic. Alex is fantastic. Uh, I don't know them well, but the, to the level that I know them, I believe they are really good people and they care passionately about your success, if that means anything. And I had the chance to spend some time with Andy today and uh, yesterday too. I believe, I believe they come from good roots, these people. And, uh, and I think that would be important to you. And of course, you're hearing from people that have been in the business with LifeMark for 27 years. That should say something as well. So give them your attention today. Give attention to my new buddy, Paul Ma, because we had a chance to hear him speak yesterday. He's excellent. And uh, if I can help you with anything in the future, uh, let's do it. I want a quick goodbye story, and then we'll wrap up. I'm getting out of an airplane. I'm going to be doing it in a few minutes. And I'm playing the game that you often play on the airplane. And this story is good because it ties together a lot of this stuff. I'm playing the game that you often play, which is I wonder who's sitting next to me today. And a beautiful woman gets on the plane. She starts walking down the aisle. And I'm thinking maybe it's her. Maybe she's going to sit next to me. And nope, she just keeps going. She's behind me. And then a big guy gets on the plane, super-sized guy. And I thought, oh, could be him. And he starts lumbering down the aisle. And he gets to me, and he keeps going. It's not him either. I hear my seatmate before I see him because he's talking on a cell phone. Why do people talk on a cell phone louder than they do in real life? This used to annoy me. Then I realized I get a lot of personal information from people when they do this. So I started to adjust. He gets to my row and he grunts at me. I know I need to get up. So there's a little bit of, a, little bit of time here while I'm hearing him talk on the phone. And at first he's saying goodbye to a child that does not want to say goodbye to daddy. Now he's saying goodbye to two children. By the time he sits down in his seat, he's saying goodbye to a third child who's crying so loudly, I can hear the child from my seat. And I feel for the guy. I don't have any children, I feel for the guy. To make matters worse, the flight attendant comes over and says, sir, you're gonna have to hang up on your child who's crying. Not good, right? He says, daddy's gotta go, daddy, please don't cry, daddy's gotta go, daddy's gotta go. And then he has to hang up on his son. Puts the phone in his lap, he sighs as if the weight of the world is leaving his shoulders. And I turned to him to practice. I said, Daddy's leaving home, huh? He says, Oh, you were listening. I said, How could I not? I said, How many kids do you have? He says, Three. He says, We gave them S names Sandy, Sally, and Scotty. I said, What ages? Five, six, and eight. He says, Scotty's the oldest one. He was the one that was young the loudest. He says, it happens every time I leave. I said, how often do you leave? He said, well, I travel about 18 days a month now. I said, holy crap. I saw a luggage tag on your bag. Is that where you work? He said, yeah. I said, I recognize the name of that company. I said, what do you do for them that you have to travel 18 days a month? He says, well, I'm a sales manager, and I have to make, my make sure my people are working a full day. And then he gets a look on his face, a strange look. He says, I'm sorry, I didn't get your name. <laughs> Which is interesting now, because He's already given me a lot of personal information, right? I know the names and ages of his three children. I know where he works, I don't know what he does for a living, I know how often he travels, and I know his biggest problem at work. He knows nothing about me, and it's time to play catch up. So he says, I'm sorry, I didn't get your name. I hold out my hand first, because I know the person who reaches out first has influence in any interaction. I said, my name is Michael Angelo Caruso. He says, Michael Angelo Caruso, that's a fantastic name. He says, what do you do for a living? I said, I teach sales managers how to get their people to work a full day. <laughs> he says, can I have a car? And the woman in front of us says, I want one too. So you saw some of the things that I was trying to explain to you today in that little story. It ties it all up. Uh, I love you, Life Mark. Keep doing the good work, and I hope our paths cross again. Michelangelo Caruso, out of here. Thank you. Vegas and, and being part of the LifeMark conference. Uh, hopefully everybody takes some pearls back with them and, and you start to incorporate this. Michael is available. I'm sure he'd be willing to talk to any of you. He, he is sincere. In, in the brief time that we've known him over the last couple months in preparing for this, he's reached out to a lot of people at LifeMark to interview them, to hear what your experiences are at LifeMark at all different levels. He invested a lot of time in preparing for this. 
uh, and he does care. So if you feel that there's any benefit from you of speaking with Michael, I know he'd, he'd love to talk with you more. It's not just, it's not just lip service. Michael, thank you so much. Here's a gift for you. Oh, wow. Uh, from us, just as a thank you for coming. Thank you so much.